Well, hello everyone and welcome back to our weekly question and answer series we have with a viewer from every state. Um, this week we have John from Wyoming, the, as he says, the original Wild Wild West out there joining us. Um, and you work in music, conductor, did you say you're mm -hmm. the conductor of the orchestra? And right, I, I conduct and teach. Um, violin and viola, things like I that. I always wanted to play the violin when I was younger, but it wasn't like a thing really where we lived and was kind of hard to get lessons and such in, but I always thought that would be so fun. You have to move to Wyoming. <laughs> I know, who knew, who knew in Wyoming? <laughs> I love it. Well, what is your first question for me? Well, um, I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, I'm an Orthodox Christian, and so we're not to be confused with the Roman Catholic Church. We're go all the way back to the beginning, and we have a very long tradition of ancient faith, funeral customs and traditions. Okay. And um, so all of my questions are coming from that context, basically. Okay. And my first question is, um, how much can a person do without a funeral director? In other words, what if you wanted to have like a full-on green Orthodox funeral where the family does hands-on care from the time of death until they actually lower the person into the ground. Um, and also because it's a very hands-on situation with COVID now that changes some things for everybody in the world, including um, us, we have something called the final kiss where everyone goes up and kisses the deceased yeah. person in the casket. And so all these things have a new implication. I was just wondering, are those options even possible now in this day and age? So it's going to vary a lot of um, the hands-on and how much a funeral director is involved is going to depend on by state. Some states, you don't even have to go through a funeral home for part of what you're doing, um, but others you have to. So it just depends on the law. So like in Michigan, which is, I'll just speak from here, just because I know these laws the best. Mm -hmm. we, the, if there is a body, there is a funeral director. Okay. That's, that is, we have to be in charge of that deceased until the person is at their final disposition. So whether it's cremation or burial, we're there until the lid goes on that vault, we're there until the cremation's complete. Um, and then beyond that, states have different laws. So like in Indiana, a funeral director still has to be present at the graveside if it's cremated remains being buried. Michigan, mm -hmm. we do not. Um, so there's, there's some variances by state. Some states you don't have to have, like if the person's in the casket, you know, so the family can take them at that point. But some states, the funeral director still needs to be involved. And some of that's also going to depend on the funeral home and their comfort level where if I took a person in a casket and dropped them off at the church, I'm going to want my, uh, someone from my staff to be there mm -hmm. during calling hours. And, you know, some, this, the, a lot of places will even have the church sign something if they leave the individual there for the night to make that the mm -hmm. church promises they're going to be in a locked room, secured. But some funeral homes won't even leave the casket at a church overnight because they want to make sure that if they're in the care of the funeral home, they're completely in the care of the funeral home and that they're not opening themselves up for any risk. So some of that is going to depend on the, the funeral home. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of it just goes back on liability. Now with like, if let's say you came and said, Hey, I want to do as natural as possible. I want you to bring my mom to the house. We're going to keep her at the house for a little while. Then we're going to do the burial it's gonna depend on the funeral home, what they're gonna say and how much they're gonna wanna be there for some of those things. I would preface a lot with a very blunt discussion on what you could encounter with what your mom's changes may go through because my, my worry is those worst case scenarios, which I think is everyone's, that I'm gonna bring your mom to you, drop her off, she's gonna spend some time, you're going to call me at 2 a.m. frantic because you went and looked at mom and she has black stuff coming out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. Her eye popped open. You know, all these things that could happen that may freak somebody out, I guess, sure. for lack of better words. But it's very natural and that doesn't throw us, but it's going to throw a family when they're envisioning this peaceful, beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, flower covered 
moments with mom, but yet nature's going to take its course and nature sure. doesn't yeah. look beautiful and peaceful like people. So I think some of that is just in conversation and communication and, you know, comfort levels as well. But there's things that you can do to set up that family to make that be as hands-on and wonderful as they want it to be. Does that, I don't know if that answers question part one. And then that second part, um, it's going to be comfort level of the community members and the church members. If they want to do that final kiss, especially when someone's been embalmed, they're sanitized and their mm -hmm. comfort level for the most part there. However, right now we're dealing with a virus that is very unknown in a lot of capacities. We don't know its longevity in terms of how long it can be active. It's been found active for quite some time on a deceased. However, if we are sanitizing and that's the purpose of embalming, then we should be kind of um, killing that virus off when we're doing that. But it's gonna be comfort level of the community members. So you may come up with a different version of that, that act that maybe you are kissing the casket or a pitcher or sure. something else that maybe can translate over for mm -hmm. safety and comfort level of everyone rather than some people feeling like, well, I want to go up and do this, but I'm not comfortable doing it. So I would almost encourage, like when I was talking to the family, say, you know, maybe you announce before that moment to everybody in the church rather than doing this we are going to do this which is to us the symbolic that kind of takes that pressure off maybe some of the church members from feeling like they're doing something they don't want to or like they're going to stand out and people are going to look at them funny yeah I don't, I don't think there's ever been that sort of like you have to do this but like right. sometimes um it's it's quite acceptable to, to like if an icon is buried with the person you can kiss the icon or oh, if there's nice. a blessing cross you can kiss the cross so i don't think there's any rigid rule i'm just saying no, like you're that's good typically you get that close and many people do that and and um you know it freaks a lot of people out that don't understand this custom they're just like no way and i'm like well yeah this is the person that you've kissed your whole life why are you scared now i mean it makes no sense in that it, it's context. any of the logic i think you know people are always like oh my gosh it's so gross i'm like two minutes ago your grandma was breathing and she was the most matriarchal person within your family very revered and now two minutes later she's all uh, she's all of a sudden disgusting because she's dead like that doesn't make any rational sense to me I don't know how it makes sense to, you know, but that's kind of what it is, is people all of a sudden, just because the person's not breathing, they've gone into this disgusting mm -hmm. thing, but then it's like, well, but not my grandma, everybody else. And it's like, well, but, but look at what you said. So I always, that part just doesn't, you know, but it's kind of that same thing. Some people are comfortable, some aren't, some, you know. It's kind of interesting to me. Um, afar a lot of people have converted to becoming orthodox because they attended an orthodox mm -hmm. funeral i know we are blessed in casper here to have an orthodox christian who is at a funeral home mm -hmm. and apparently he he witnessed some funerals and he was like that's what made him convert because of the the great hands-on sort of reverence mm -hmm. aspect to this so mm -hmm. Um, it's, just, it's just interesting to me how different yeah. people do this. Um, my next question is sort of in tandem with that one. Um, are there different levels or tiers of invasiveness that a funeral director can do? In other words, can they do minimal amount of um, either, either embalming or, or just preparation of a body can they be very very minimal or is it all or nothing are there different levels that can be achieved from from your point of view so there is a term that has kind of started that some people refer to as a partial embalming 
Um, mm -hmm. So we get more people ready for identifications or viewing prior to cremation now. Like that is becoming a more common thing that, you know, grandma died, we want a small group of people want to come see her before the cremation, grandkids weren't in town, so and so. And so we get the individual ready for viewing. They may just be on a table or a cot covered mm -hmm. in a quilt, but we're going to set their features. We're going to clean off their, you know, clean their nose, clean their mouth, close mm -hmm. their eyes, close their mouth, um, and get them ready for that viewing. So that's kind of that minimum for viewing is doing that. The next step, I would say, is a little more invasive. We could aspirate, which is removing that some of the fluids and things from the abdomen or the chest. We may do that if gas is building up and we're getting some purge out sure. of the mouth and the nose, and we need to control it. So we might aspirate. Sometimes they will, if the family permits, put some uh, cavity fluid right into the cavity to help preserve that abdomen. If the person is decomposing at a certain rate that we need to maybe help preserve them, we can use cooling units. Like people say freezers, but we don't really have freezers. It's more keeping the individual cooled. We don't freeze their bodies at the funeral homes. And then we can go to, or we can go reverse of that and just inject in the circulatory system and not aspirate. So you can do parts depending what maybe we're going for. Um, if the person's face is very blotchy and maybe they just want that coloring fixed, we could just inject up into the head to help balance out that color and not inject down into the rest of the body. Sure. So, so there are ways if people say, you know, we want to achieve maybe some of the color and a little preservation without the full embalming, we can kind of meet them halfway. Okay. The cost thing, it's probably not going to cost any less mm -hmm. because you have a skilled person with a specific skill set spending an amount of time with the deceased. I don't think it's going to change the cost per se. It's just going to change, like you said, the invasiveness and, and such with the individual. So okay. I can see, though, with, with some religions, some beliefs that people want less of that process happening. But there are all these different ways. It just depends why they're asking that and what we can do to, you know, achieve the best outcome for from the funeral home standpoint and for the family. So it goes back to that communication, the why and how we can achieve it for both sides. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um let's see another question. Um do most funeral directors have access to what I could maybe coin as like a, a denominational how-to book? Like, do they have a different book to go to if they get someone coming in from a religion and there maybe isn't a lot of that particular denomination in that community? Do they have some sort of handbook where they at least know where to start? Google. Um, <laughs> you know, there are books. Uh, when we went through school, I was going to see if I have mine. Um, I don't see it right over there. I'm trying to think where it's at in my office where it's just a basic, there might be a chapter, like two or three pages on different religions. When we're in school, we're learning it more for the terms mm -hmm. of the religious, um, you know, people within and what their roles are and what their titles are, or maybe like in the Jewish faith, what, you know, Shiva is and what, you know, all these different things are. But we don't remember all those when they're not common things that we use every day. Sure. So it does become hard for us to be masters of something we may never encounter or only once in a great while. So it's kind of like re educating. When I started working at one funeral home that does, handle um, deceased of the Muslim faith, it was like, whoa, I need to re-educate myself on all of this because I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And it is when we get a call sometimes within a certain religion or faith or belief or anything, the easiest thing is to talk with the family or to tell the family, can you connect us to whoever we need to speak to at your church, synagogue, care center or whatever that place is called because they're going to give us the 
quickest education on what they want us to do because I could look up, let's say Methodist, but I could go into 10 different Methodist churches and every one of them is going to have a pastor that yeah. wants something different. Exactly. So the easiest mm -hmm. thing is really talking to somebody from their community group that can help prep us and educate us and walk us through maybe some of the things. Um, you know, I think the, one of the things that could be the worst things we could do is thinking or pretending like we are masters of something that we're not. And mm -hmm. to me, I have always found saying, I'm new to this. I'm just learning. Could you slow down what you're saying? Like if you're new on the phones and you're taking a phone, a death call or something, I always, as I'm training people, I, I'm, I always tell them the best thing you can say first and foremost is I'm training Please have just a little patience. This call may take an extra few minutes because I'm not, you know, as routine at going through these questions. And it gives you a lot, it gets you a lot of grace from those people that they're like, okay, I understand that. We all had to start somewhere and sure. people will understand that. And especially if you um, communicate that I would like to make sure we're respecting your loved one with the most care that we can. And I want to make sure that I'm not insulting or doing anything against your religion and your beliefs so please feel free to tell me if you know and that's going to be when they can say you know you're a woman it's not going to work or <laughs> you're this it's not going to work and that's honestly that's in some faiths they can't deal with women or they can't exchange money with women or they can't deal with men or they can't so knowing that up front we want to make sure we can do as much as we can sometimes it's not going to work if you if they call an all female funeral home, you're going to get a female only um, or a male only. And so sometimes it doesn't work, but communication goes back to that is you've got to tell your needs and we can say if we can meet them. And then, but like you said, Google sometimes can be our quickest because it's always with us, with our phone, mm -hmm. with everything that we can quick look some things up maybe um, because a book is sometimes going to drown you in terms and things that you don't need to know right off the bat but sure yep it's interesting one person was talking i read somewhere about how we want to have our our deceased person making contact with the earth mm. but some cemeteries require a vault so someone said why not turn the vault invert the vault yes. put it the other way with no lid and then you've covered both situations yeah. Well, and that's what um, I found with, you know, a lot of situations with Muslim and, and Jewish and everything is they, they do, they meet the needs of the cemetery, but yet that individual can mm -hmm. stay as close to the earth as possible. And there's no reason not to, but you do get into cemeteries that say, no, 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 we have to do this because blah, blah, whatever the rationale and they can't think outside the box that they've been in for so long, but there are ways to meet the needs of both sides. It's just figuring it out together and both sides having to maybe give a little, um, a little give, a little take. So, yeah. That was a good pun, by the way. Thinking Which one? Outside the box. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, I just was curious from your point of view, what specific challenges you, if you've encountered any or, um, for people like that are way out in the middle of nowhere that maybe don't have a big population, you know, maybe for the family, what, what some resources are. I, I have some resources too, but I was just curious what, if you had any challenges specific that were just really difficult for you to overcome. In terms of just anything? Any, any logistics. It's just always, I'm always curious because there's always that time crunch involved and things. You know, sometimes time is your biggest Mm -hmm. Just in saying that, sometimes time is your biggest factor where families want things in certain specific time frames or um, especially with cremation, sometimes we run into that being our biggest challenge is time where we're kind of at the mercy of doctors signing and medical examiners signing and it's not about really when we want to do things. And so there is definitely a delay when it comes to needing to do the cremation in the middle rather than just the person being buried. And so retraining some families that are maybe choosing cremation for a first time that they think, okay, mom died. We'll have the service in two days and bury them. 
doesn't work that fast when it comes to cremation. And especially right now, some doctor's offices were, are taking a lot longer to sign death certificates because maybe they're not in the office. We just ran into um, a doctor that was out because they had COVID, so they couldn't sign the death certificate. You know, so we're running into a lot of other challenges that we just have to understand there's, there, you know, things sometimes don't work in the time frame we want them to work. Death is not convenient ever. Mm -hmm. And time is sometimes the biggest things people can't wrap their mind around. Well, our family is going to be together this date and it has to work on that day. Well, it's not going to work on that day. I'm sorry, but I understand we can only do so much when it comes to things because of a weekend or, you know, people get really upset that the national cemeteries won't do burials on weekends. It's a government run, you know, cemetery. It's a Monday through Friday. Well, our family can only do Saturday. It's not happening. And so some of that just time, time I think is always going to be our battle is death is not convenient and we want to try and make it convenient, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, sure. And trying to get families to understand maybe some of the things we tell them and they don't want to listen, even though we're the professionals at death, they don't, you know, want to listen to that sometimes is the biggest, um, the biggest hindrance. And like you were saying distance, you know, you may have the person maybe cross country. We can't just stick them on the next plane and get them in to our community. We may have to go to a airport three hours away because the local doesn't have flights that bring in human remains because every mm -hmm. place does not carry human remains. Every airport does not receive human remains. We may have to go to a different and every, we may have to, they may have to go from, you know, Washington to Alabama back up to Michigan to get on flights that can get to us the soonest but that means it's going to take three days of transport or, you know, that we run into really weird situations that families don't want to accept sometimes because of the time. So I would say, honest to goodness, that's the biggest thing we encounter is time delays and people not liking that. <laughs> sure, yeah. It not being acceptable. Mm -hmm. Because um, people, you know, you may be with somebody on hospice and they call you and they say, well, we want to schedule the funeral. Well, the person's not even dead. Well, we want to schedule it because we want it to be convenient. Our family's here. We want to get it scheduled. They're not dead. And they, they want to schedule. Well, we, let's get the obit in Sunday's paper. They're not dead. And they, well, they're going to die tonight. We're sure of it. We have seen the we're sure of it go on living for another month or come off life support and go back out and go home. So, you know, trying to convince somebody that they can't put the cart before the horse, it, you know, just time is, they just want it to be convenient. It's just not. Sure. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between uh, like a healthcare POA and a death care POA? Are they two different forms? Um, you, so, when it comes to POA for death stuff, there really isn't in most states such a thing per se, um, unless you're thinking, are you thinking like disposition designation? Like, Right. To, like say I want to plan exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. um, is there a specific form coming from me? while I'm still in my right mind and everything to make the arrangement or can that be piggybacked onto like just a health care POA form? Are they different forms? Um, there's, so it depends on the state. So in some states, like if you came to Michigan and you made your prearrangements, they don't have to be followed because you are not here to say for yourself and to sign your paperwork for yourself as to what you want done. They are essentially requests okay. that your family doesn't have to follow. Other states, that's not the case. Other states, you can go in and sign your cremation paperwork and whatever and choose for yourself, and it has to be followed. So every state is not the same in that capacity. Mm -hmm. But like in Michigan, you can designate somebody. So you could say, 
I want Jim Smith from down the road to be my designee for my disposition. And he would then be the one that comes in and signs the authorization for cremation or directs us for burial. It doesn't make him financially responsible, but it means that he will give us direction above anybody else. So it's not really, there's no power of attorney. Power of attorney is for a living person. Um, but we do have some things where maybe a cemetery needs some paperwork signed by the family of the deceased and they're from out of town. So they may give the funeral home a specific power of attorney just to go sign the cemetery paperwork. Okay. So those are the only power of attorney things that kind of exist in our world because power of attorney is for somebody who's living and all power of attorney ends at death. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions is we get people call and say, well, I'm power of attorney for so-and-so. Well, that ended when so-and-so died. It ends at death. It doesn't matter what kind of power of attorney that was. It ends at death. However, you can get into these designee sort of situations for disposition that those are active after death. So some of that gets into a confusing territory for some families. Essentially, the person would be an executor of the estate is who that power of attorney usually rolls into the executorship when it comes to the money side of it and such. Um, and then for health care, you have that POA maybe that can sign off to take you off life support or something, but then that goes away at death as well. Okay. So, but... We get into the whole, each state has different little nuances to some of those things as well. Awesome. Maybe every state was the same. Like we had one national United States of America, <laughs> death and dying rules and regulations. It would make everything so much easier. Yep, it would. Yeah. Very interesting. Do you have one more question? I don't know what number we're at even, but. Um, I probably went past. <laughs> Um, it, it, it opens up so many different questions. I mean, um, yeah. there is a very interesting YouTube that I thought I would share with you and any of your listeners that are interested. It's called A Christian Ending by mm -hmm. a Deacon Frank Barna. Okay, it's a I'll check it out. YouTube. It, was, it is a book, but it's also a YouTube lecture that he does, and he talks about all of these topics that I'm discussing sort of in great okay. detail. And I think it would just be very interesting who, if, if there's anyone interested in doing like um, maybe home, home death care, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing, um, yeah. or getting involved with a funeral home to maybe oversee, like, we want to do this, but we would really appreciate you being there as the professional. Mm -hmm. um, so it's no, just a very, great. very interesting uh, book, audio book or video broadcast if anyone's interested in that. So. Perfect. Yeah, I'll check that out. I haven't watched it yet. So I can I'll... send you a link if you put it on there or something. It's yeah, I will. I'll grab the link and put it in this video so that we have it. Perfect. Great. Ooh, well, thanks, John. I appreciate the questions from... I had one more comment. Yeah. Um, being from Wyoming, I'm planning to be buried in my cowboy boots. Nice. Uh, oh, someone nice. mentioned that they're really... They're hard. hard. They're horrible. Can you just put them down the back? You know, it's so funny because that seems so logical, doesn't it? I never, it's one of those, it's such an easy answer. It was almost too easy. And I never thought of that until somebody recommended that. And I was like, oh, who'd have thought? My, the only problem, um, I think a lot of people want them back. Oh. Um, kind of like leather vests, like a biker vest or something. We'll have people bring them and say they want them back. So I would never cut those just like the leather boots. I would worry. I would be like, okay, you're going to have to sign something if you want me to cut those that you never want them back because otherwise I'll say, let's just display them and we'll put them in with them after or something or, you know, come up with other, but yeah, cutting them down the back is so logical. I never, I think would have thought of it just because a lot of people, I don't know. It's one of those, I would hate to, I would hate to damage them just because a lot of they are such a special thing mm -hmm. to somebody. Um, so I would worry about cutting them that somebody would change their mind on me and I'd have to go. Make them put it in writing. 
<laughs> I know. Perfect. Well, I love it. Well, thanks, Don. I appreciate all the, the info and the questions and stuff. So, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining us with John in Wyoming. And check us out next Sunday to see what stay we're coming from next. Bye, guys. Bye.